Dunaberry Moore Park. I, he's a mathematical genius behind doing the number crunching behind the EBI. And if we didn't have the EBI, we have, and obviously there's a lot of other people to thank as regards the EBI, but I'm just singling out Dunna. If we didn't have the EBI, I don't think we'd have the industry we have at the moment as regards the classic how we have in the place. Donna, I'm not sure what you have to tell us today, but it has always been interesting, it has always been new, it has always been pushing out the barriers. You yourselves would like to admit that you are well above the average, but here we're talking about the average dairy farmer, 300,000 litres, they on average supplied milk to feed almost 3,000 people last year, if we exclude butter consumption. Or in other words, if you put it another way, each lactation of the average Irish dairy cow produced enough milk to feed 44 people, or in Ireland as a whole, 47 people. So when I was putting together my talk, when I found out that, that John McNamara was actually chairing the session, I had to rearrange it, because if you don't know, John has the attention span of a tadpole. So what I've done <laughs> is I've put my summary at the very, very start, so John, you can at least get, get what my talk was about this time. What I'm going to hopefully convince you is that in Ireland and also abroad, we have the potential to increase or double the milk solids production of all of our herds. And again, everything I'm talking about is at an average level, but we have the elite of the elite here. You're early adopters of technology. So although the figures I'm expressing are at averages, I'm sure you could all also achieve exactly the same. Push it in another way. I said, the average dairy cow can feed 178 people over its lifespan. We can increase that to 356 people per cow to fed with dairy products. So the question I ask, is this the cow of the future for Ireland or any other country? She's the Guinness Book record holder. Produced 32,000 kilos of milk, over 1,000 kilos of fat, and 1,000 kilos of protein over a 365 day lactation. She produced the calorific value of half a carcass of beef every week, or the calorific value of a whole carcass of beef every fortnight. Now, needless to say, she wasn't in calf. But anyway, <laughs> I firmly believe that this is potentially the cow for Ireland, with the exception, that, of course, that she is in calf. And I just want to show you, let's look at the poultry industry. It's put up there in the pedestal as being the best of the best. It's operated by very few, essentially four breeding companies with a single breeding direction. A breeding direction, I didn't say the correct breeding direction. They have also got it wrong like we did in dairying. But what I'm showing you here is a strain of chicken from 1957 and also a strain of chicken from 2001. And this is their days of age. Look, I don't need to tell you any more details about that. It's pretty obvious the genetic gain that has achieved to increase the breast size of these particular chickens. We'll look at it another way. We see a, a chicken 68 days of age from 1950, 50, 60 years later, a lot younger and obviously a lot larger. Now again, came with its own problems with heart problems, leg problems, etc. Not that dissimilar to what we experienced with the Holstein breed. And just finally, there's this, one of the best experiments I have seen where they had two strains of chickens, one from 1957 and one from 2001. They fed the 1957 strain, a diet representative of 1957, but also a diet representative of 2001, and they did exactly the same for the other. So a really good design study comparing scenarios in 57 and scenarios in 2001. The animals in 2001, they took one third of the time to reach their target weight and ate one third of the less to achieve, uh, less to achieve that. Now, if you actually work that out, and I, as I say, as a geneticist, I like to say that we're around 50% of the gains that we see in, in most breeding programs is due to genetics. Here, in one of the best design studies, they showed that almost 90% of that was actually due to genetics. This is a kind of an example of, of, of what's happening in Ireland. Let's just, it's very hypothetical. Let's just assume that you work the average industrial year. Now, we know we don't, but let's just say you work for 231 days a year. You probably just spend around one day choosing your bulls. So in other words, something that's worth 90% of the gains potentially in your farm, you spend 0.4% of your time actually working on it. Now, that to me is a huge return on investment, but also, 
emphasises the importance of correctly identifying those bulls, spending more time identifying what animals to use or to keep uh, as parents of the next generation. So if we just look at what has, has been achieved in Ireland, and he, this is the milk solids yields of the Irish dairy herd, um, in red is what farmers, you yourselves, have observed over the past 20, 30 years. And the blue is the genetic merit of those cows for milk solids yield. So if we actually look at this period, around half the gains that ye saw, because I chose this period because really it wasn't really that much um, Im impacted by quota, but around half the gains that were due there were actually due to breeding. If we look at reproduction, and we look at again the period where it's getting worse, around one third of the deterioration in reproduction was actually due to genetics. However, more importantly, this is calving interval in red, calving interval getting worse, more importantly, what we see here, I, of course, like to say that I started to work for Chagas around the year 2001. We started to turn that trend around. We started to do what we were told we couldn't do. We were told we couldn't breed for fertility. We had been crucified for breeding for infertility. And then people had the cheek to tell us that we couldn't breed fertility back into our animals. Of course, now, we probably didn't see it. Our year ourselves didn't see it year on year. But if you retrospectively look back to the type of cow you had five years ago versus high EBI cows today, you're probably attributing a lot of that improvement to actually EBI or to genetics. We're crystal ball gazers as, uh, as animal breeders, so if we bring that the last five years of genetic gain in fertility forward to the next five years to the year 2020, which a lot of us are always talking about, I would argue that Ireland will have the most fertile Holstein Frisian herd in the world by the year 2020. Our fertility levels of the females born that year will be what they were in 1989, which is still not optimal, but it'll be back to where it was in 1989, with arguably a 60% increase in milk solids over that period. So we go back to my lovely lady producing half the carcass calorific value every week. There is the potential there to significantly increase our yield per cow while holding our reproduction constant. So that's really essentially what my talk is about, is doubling the yield potential of our animals. And I, I have a, a, an envelope here, it's a back of an envelope calculation. So yes, there are inaccuracies inside of it, there are assumptions made, but it is broadly, I would argue, probably even an underestimate or a conservative estimate of where we can go. So in 2014, I didn't cho choose last year because with, with quotas being abolished, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a, a hairy situation to, to get some good data out of. But on average, your cows are, are, are just achieving four lactations each. The milk solids yields on average in Ireland is 375 kilos. The average calving date that I got from the ICBF database is the 3rd of March. Unfortunately, Irish farmers are very poor at recording dry off dates, but Brendan Horne told me that dry-off date is probably around the 20th of November, the, the mean dry-off date. So that would give us an average lactation length of 262 days. So that's what we're working off of. Can we double the yield potential per cow working off that base in the next 20 years? This is just showing you the average number of lactations achieved per cow by herd. So what we have here is this is the percentage of herds and this is the lactations per cow. On average, cows are achieving four lactations. You can do that yourselves. You can look at the average lactation number of the cows you've culled for the past three to four years. On average, you're going to be around four. There's a very small proportion of you that are achieving at least five and a half lactations per cow, which is where we want to be. So if we can increase the number of lactations per cow from four to five and a half straight away, that's a 40% increase in milk solids yield potential per cow. And I'll tell you later on how we're going to achieve that. And it's very, very easily achieved. Just on a side, that's actually costing us, by having one and a half less lactations per cow, that's costing us 1.7 cent per litre, which in, a, in an era of, of volatile and low milk price is obviously a, a vital 1.7 cent per litre. If we look at lactation length, I, I told you 3rd of March till the 20th of November. So if we could extend that just by 23 days, up to 285 days, so let's say, drying off on the 10th of December, pull back calving it just three or four days, there you have a 4% increase in milk solids straight away, just by extending your lactation length. If we were to go a little bit more drastic, maybe push off our dry off date until the 20th of December, pull it back until the 18th of February, not suitable for everybody, so I'm not going to discuss it, that's a three or five day lactation equivalent. There is a 7% 
increase in milk solids. But we're not going to talk about that. Let's just focus, be conservative, focus on the 4%. So we now have one and a half more lactations, and each lactation we're getting 4% more milk solids. So now, of that doubling, we have achieved almost half of it straight away. Genetic merit. Of course, being a geneticist, I'm going to have to stand up here and talk about the, the benefits of genetics. But what I'm talking about here is additive genetic merit. This is EBI. So this is the one that's transmitted directly from one generation to the next. This does not include crossbreeding. That will be covered in the next slide. Generally, we would assume that genetics account, is, uh, genetic gain is around 1% per year. That's without genomics. We expect it to be 1.5% per year with genomics, once things stabilize a little bit. In Ireland, unfortunately, we're just achieving 0.7%. Per year but that's really based on a lot of it is based on pre pre genomic genetic gain so if we assume in the next 20 years a one percent gain per year now we have a 20 percent increase in milk solids production and as arrogant as i am as a geneticist i do like to accept that, that brian mccarthy and fergal have a little bit to contribute through management and through better grassland management and in fact they contribute the other 50 percent so we've got 20 percent from myself and 20% from, from Brian. So now we've got a 40% increase in, and John, 40% increase in milk solids over that period. So now we have one and a half more lactations, 4% more per lactation and 40% greater yield per lactation. So now we have actually achieved and surpassed doubling the milk yield potential of our cows in the next 20 years. And that's not including crossbreeding, which we call non-additive genetic merit, which is not directly transmitted from one generation to the next. If you look across the international data, New Zealand would probably have one of the strongest data on this, but this heterosis or hybrid vigor effect is generally around 5% for milk production. Our data based on the ICBF, a Holston Friesian Jersey cross is around 6.4%. That's for your first cross. When you go into a rotational cross of Jersey, Holstein, Jersey, Holstein, you just retain around two thirds of that. And also, of course, between the Holstein and the Frisian, there's a little bit of hydrosis. So this Holstein, Jersey cross is around 2% better over time than, than, than a Holstein, Frisian cross. So now we're well surpassing this 100% increase in milk solids production over, that, over the next 20 years. Lovely story, but is it actually achievable? So the next part of my talk is just to prove to you that I guess when you saw my talk summary, you said, I'm bonkers, doubling milk yield in 20, 20 years, impossible. You saw this, you said, that's also bonkers. But now I'm going to prove to you that it is really achievable. <laughs> Let's start off with more lactations. So five and a half lactations, that's what I said. That's what I said our target is. That just equates to an 18% replacement rate. We'd like that to be half voluntary and half involuntary. So involuntary is where the cow is just not in calf. You, you don't have a choice, you really have to colour for a seasonal calving system. Let's look at the next generation herd in calf rate. Over the last three years has been 90%. That's with a 12 week breeding season, predominantly AI. The fertility sub-index is 142. That's the target that we're putting out there. It's around 140 fertility sub-index is where you really want to be to achieve the, the targets for seasonal calving system under good management. Obviously, if you don't put a straw into a cow, she's not gonna go and calf. If we look at the cows born in 2014, their fertility sub-index was 83 euros, and it's increasing by around 6.4 euros per year. So the fertility sub-index of females born in, the, in 20 years' time will be 211. Now, I think even John McNamara can do the maths on that one. That is significantly larger than what the fertility sub-index of the next generation elite animals are, who are achieving, under good management, who are achieving seasonal calving targets. Also, if you look at the milk sub-index, it's also significantly larger than what the, the elite herd um, milk sub-index is. So 18% replacement rate is definitely achievable. So therefore, five and a half lactations per cow is definitely achievable. Look at longer lactations then. Um, so longer lactations is obviously driven by fertility to some extent. Uh, the mean calving interval of Irish dairy cows, if we ignore 2013, it's a lot larger, it's a lot uh, more favourable if you include 2013, but something funny happened there, I'm not really sure what happened. But calving interval is improving by around three days per year. If we translate that to calving date, given the situation we are at that time under quota, Mean calving date is coming forward by around one and a half days per year. So obviously, even again, 
John can do the maths, 20 times 1.5 is definitely larger than 23. So it is very easy for us to achieve a 23 day longer lactation length. Now, there are some assumptions inside all this, this basic maths that I've done back in the envelope calculations. The one that gives me the, the most of the willies is the fact of quota going. And lads saying, geez, we need more milk. You know, and I'll touch on this again in a second. Just very, very quickly, there's three ways to increase milk production in, in Irish dairy herds. One, genetically select for milk. I think everybody accepts that. Two, longer lactations, which is what I've just talked about. There is a 4% gain in milk production achieved by a modest improvement in lactation length by having better fertility and allowing us to do that. And three is survival. A mature cow yields 22% more solids than a first lactation cow. So if you have a high replacement rate, you're actually, your herd is has a lower milk yield potential or lower milk yield than its actual potential. The other thing, because we don't really know what's going to happen, is quota abolishment. I haven't modelled that inside in this. And we know the explosion in milk yield that we got this year, even with the start of the year still being under a quota regime. So I really think that a doubling of the yield potential of our cow is a real underestimate of the potential that is there. And again, I've done a lot of my assumptions on an Irish level, but this is easily applicable to the UK and, and Dutch contingent here as well. It also ignores te the technological developments in the next 20 years. So essentially it means that I'm going to sit on my backside in Moore Park for the next 20 years and do absolutely no more research. We know with genomic selection, it's increasing genetic gain by 50%. We've only been working on genomic selection for eight years. We've been working on the old system for 60 years. Not, not me personally, by the way, of course. The other one is sex even. Now look, it's, it's, it's not here. I, I re firmly believe in the next three to five years, it's going to be just routine. Um, the, the, the flip side, uh, again, I'll touch on this in a second, is the new traits within the EBI. If we put new traits into the EBI, we are going to slightly reduce the selection pressure on milk and on fertility. So our rate of gain will, will slightly reduce um, for when we do that. So just looking into the future then, uh, and this is the three aspects I'm going to talk about. One is the emphasis on traits in the EBI. Two, the new traits that I see coming into the EBI. And three are these DNA-based technologies, or genomic selection. Where are we going with this uh, DNA technology? So this is how the EBI has evolved over the past few years since its introduction in the year 2001. The blue there is the emphasis on milk production. So obviously the emphasis on milk production was 100% in the old RBI days, 30% emphasis on fertility in 2001, and then up to around 40% emphasis. But despite actually what you've sometimes heard, especially in the earlier days, that the EBI was always bloody moving, would they ever stop, would they ever keep it constant? The EBI, if you look at it, hasn't really changed in 10 years. It has subtly changed as we get more knowledge about the future milk price, the future concentrate price, etc. We just subtly are changing those figures. But one of the things that's coming back to me now in a lot of conferences and discussion groups is farmers are saying, now a quote has gone, we just, can we not just take a little bit of pressure off fertility? We have fertility solved, is what people are saying. The first problem is that we don't have fertility solved. The next generation herd is around 10 to 15 years ahead of the average Irish dairy farm. So yes, we're en route to solving the fertility problem, but we certainly do not have it solved. If we want to hold fertility constant, I want to show you how much emphasis we, we have to put on it. So what I want to show in here is if we do what some people would like us to do and take some of the emphasis from fertility and put it onto milk production, what happens for milk and what happens for fertility? So on the bottom here, this is the EBI today. There's around 36% emphasis on milk production, 29% emphasis on fertility. So by fertility, I mean calving interval and survival. And that's the gains we expect to see per year in milk solids at a genetic level. If we take 2% off fertility and put it straight onto milk, obviously you're going to get more gains in milk. And as you put more and more emphasis on milk, your gains in milk solids are going to increase. That, that's, that's logic. The problem is what happens to fertility. When you start taking, this is our gains that we're currently achieving in, in fertility, uh, minus 0.8 days, so always one day per year. What we can see is that it's slowly and slowly eroding. And the same with survival. Our gains in survival are eroding and eroding. And if you draw a line on zero, if we take 9% emphasis off of fertility and put it onto milk production, we are going backwards straight away. Our fertility is starting to get worse and worse. So it's crucial that we essentially hold the line, keep our emphasis on fertility. You can see that's a modest gain in fertility to be achieving still with 30% emphasis. 
So we don't see the economic values in the EBI changing anytime soon. Look at new traits, and again, I challenge anybody out here to give me one trait that is not under genetic control. I yet have somebody to challenge that. If it is under genetic control, then we can breed for it. The extent to which or the speed at which we can do it, that's another day's work. But what I'm showing here is the, the different traits on the bottom axis and what we call the heritability. So how much genetic variation is there? So milk production, it's around 30% heritable, 35% heritable. Amongst the field, the cows, around 35% of the differences in them is due to their genetics. Milk, uh, milk uh, composition, around 50, 52% heritable. Fertility, lowly heritable. Everybody telling us we couldn't improve it years ago, but now, of course, we all know that that is rubbish, that we can improve it, even with such a low heritability. So we can select for whatever we want to, as long as it is important and as long as we can measure it. So I would argue that if we look internationally at the indexes that are there, the dairy indexes, there's three main components missing. Animal health, product quality, of course Ireland being such an important, having such an important reliance on, on, on export markets, crucially important, and feed intake and efficiency. So I'm going to tackle the three of them. Let's just start on, on health. I'm uh, showing you four diseases here. I could show up a number of different diseases. This is the mean incidence of these diseases in the different SAR groups. So let's just start with lameness. All of these bulls had to have at least 50 progeny in at least 20 different herds. What this is saying here, this is lameness, the daughter prevalence, there's several bulls here where none of their daughters got lame. There's other bulls who have daughters on the same farms where 39% of their daughters got lame. None, 39, all managed the same. Mastitis. Very few got, none of them, none of their daughters got mastitis. Some of them, 46% of their daughters got mastitis. Same farm. Cystic ovaries. Some bulls, 12% of their daughters got cystic ovaries. Lots of bulls there, none of their daughters got cystic ovaries on the same farm. Tuberculosis is a bit more exaggerated. One bull here, he's an old bull, Buzz, 96% of his daughters got TB while other bulls on the same farm, none of their daughters got TB. And just to kind of emphasize that point a bit further, some of you, I'm sure, have got TB on your farm. You might have lost 10, 20% of your herd. Why didn't you lose 100% of your herd? TB is spread nose to nose in, uh, of your cow herd. They're all coming into milking twice per day. Why didn't every cow go down with tuberculosis? I would argue genetics. The next aspect is product quality, and Pete talked about the export markets, getting into these high-value markets, these value-added products. It doesn't matter what the science says, it's what the media says, and at the moment, saturated fats are bad. The science is proving otherwise, but at the moment, the perception out there, saturated fats are bad. So what we did is we went into the next generation herd, and we looked at the saturated fatty acid content of those animals. They haven't been selected, they're all managed exactly the same, this is it. Some of those animals, 57% of their fat was saturated. Same animals measured exactly the same, uh, in the same system, 69% of their fat was saturated. Phenomenal differences in the saturated fatty acids. Imagine going to the retailers, telling them that we can not only can we produce milk that was produced in an environmentally friendly and socially friendly green environment, but it's actually way better for you. And there's no processing. It, this is breeding. If you look at it, unfortunately, so the blue here is the national average, you can see you're turning towards the left, and the elite EBI animals are to the right. Unfortunately, it looks like the EBI is selecting for more saturated fat in the, in the fat. And, and this is what we would see internationally as well, especially in the Dutch data, as you select for fat, you tend to increase the proportion of saturated fat within it. But the, 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 the point I'm trying to make is the potential is there to actually select against saturated fat. Also look at casein content, and I could, again, I could throw any of these up, myocell, coagul or myocell size, coagulation properties, renting time, all of these processing characteristics under strong genetic control and considerable genetic variability there. The last one then is feed intake and efficiency. Um, so what I've done here is this is from Moore Park data, all Halsted Frisian cows, this is their average feed intake of these animals adjusted to have the same body weight and same milk energy potential or milk energy yield. So on average, they would be zero. But what you can see here, these are the, the, the daughter groups of particular, the mean intake of daughter groups of particular sires. There's four bulls here where their daughters 
is two kilos per day less than the average. Their daughters, remember, all black and white, all grass-fed, eating two kilos more per day than the average. So again, a bit of simple mathematics taking the minus two. I didn't, I didn't want to exaggerate the point. I, I, I pretended this fellow wasn't here and this guy wasn't here. But we just take from minus two to plus two, four kilos per day difference in dry matter intake, one and a half tons of dry matter per lactation, four lactations, six tons of dry matter, essentially for free, going from the worst to, to the best. All for the same yield and the same live weight. The last point I want to finish off with, and this is a bit futuristic, is this cow going to get mastitis? It's already a bit late for that. She has mastitis. But the question is, which of these cows is going to get mastitis? I could say, which of these cows is going to eat a cedar? Which of these cows is going to get sick? Which of these cows is going to get TB? The role of genomics here is phenomenal. Um, and this slide is a little bit busy, but this just shows you how accurately we can do this. So the disease prevalence is here on the bottom. So the disease with 10% prevalence, disease 20% prevalence, so something like um, mastitis or, or lameness, something down here, Bionis, TB, and these are the different heritabilities. So if we look at mastitis, maybe 3 to 5% heritability, 20% incidence, I can tell you potentially with an accuracy of 62% whether or not that cow is going to get mastitis or not. If I go to TB, I can tell you with a lot more accuracy. And just to give you an example, we have genetic evaluations for TB. When I take the top 10% of animals, so the worst 10%, purely on genetics, the day they were born, and I look at how they performed, 31% of them got TB. When I looked at the bottom 10%, this is purely, again, from a computer, from just based on parentage, the bottom 10%, 5% of them got TB. So all of these would have been exposed to the TB, so everybody would have eventually got, uh, been exposed to the virus. You might think, again, I'm a bonkers, but you look at human, and this is where this, a lot of this work is coming from. There's two genes in humans, BRCA1 and BRCA2. If you have the two bad mutations, you have 11 times greater chance of getting breast and ovarian cancer. This is where we are going to in animals. So if you just think about the mastitis case, you mightn't be giving all your cows dry cow therapy, but what you could be doing is looking at this DNA or genomic value and saying, right, that one is a decent enough chance she's going to get mastitis next year. I'm going to tube her at the end of lactation. So, Mr. Chairman, just to, just to, to, to finish, um, hopefully I, I've convinced you that uh, the, the potential is there to double the yield per cow based solely on what we're doing. Five years, I've just essentially extrapolated the last five years of selection on EBI, with or without crossbreeding. The crossbreeding will add to this even further, assuming that we can get a good Jersey breeding program. We can achieve this potential. And I, I throw down the gauntlet to the next speaker, Brian and Fergal, is can they feed this potential? And if we look at the gains we are achieving in, in grass, essentially it's, it's laughable. We are achieving half the rate of gain that we are in dairying, and that's not accounting for the fact that we probably only have three or five percent of reseeding going on, and we're achieving half the gains of what we are in wheat. So I would argue that probably the most important thing going forward is going to be actually herbage or forage breeding. Thank you very much.